The integumentary system includes our skin, our hair, and our nails. So the skin is the primary organ, the largest organ of the body itself. We have essentially three layers that make it up. We have the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis, working our way from the outside in. So the epidermis is the outermost layer. This is the layer that we can actually see. And so this is the part that we're seeing when we look at our skin. It is the protective layer itself. We then have the dermis, our next layer in. The dermis is kind of the busiest layer of all the three layers. It has all of our blood vessels, it has our hair follicles, it has sensory receptors, it has sweat glands, lots of different things going on inside that dermis. And then the deepest layer is our hypodermis. And so the hypodermis, or sometimes called the superficial fascia, uh, this is the deepest layer that is inside, primarily made up of adipose. Uh, again, has a large amount of, of blood supply to it. Um, some of our larger blood vessels are down in this area as well. So the epidermis itself is in a layer of epithelium. So just like with epithelium, it's basically all cells. And so it's very tightly packed together, keratinized, stratified squamous epithelium. Within that, we can see distinct layers that form as well. And so depending upon what's happening within those layers, they get their name for those particular layers. The primary cell that we're going to see are keratinocytes. And so those keratinocytes are the actual skin cells themselves. Those are the, the squamous cells that we have there. Deep inside uh, the epidermis, we're gonna see things like melanocytes. We're also going to see Merkel cells and Langerhan cells. And we'll talk about their functions as well. So this is the layers of the skin that keep essentially everything out and also at the same time keep everything inside of us. In. So our keratinocytes are the stratified squamous cells. These are the ones that are going to be producing all of the keratin, which hardens the cells and makes that kind of dry outer layer to the body so that we have essentially dry air outside of us. We then have dry cells that are on the outside as well. The melanocytes are deep down inside. These are the pigment producing cells. They're gonna produce primarily melanin and this is going to create the, the pigment within the, the skin itself. We then have Langerhans cells and Merkel cells. Langerhans cells are a immune cell. They're essentially kind of wandering around the epidermis looking for anything that shouldn't be there, whether it be tumor cells, whether it be infection from bacteria, virus, fungus, whatever it happens to be, they're looking for anything that shouldn't be there. And then we have Merkel cells. Merkel cells function as our first line of sensory reception. And so these are going to have all of the nerve control for light touch on the skin. So within the, the epidermis itself, we have our four or five layers, depending upon whether we're in thin skin or thick skin. And so the deepest of the layers themselves is the stratum basal. And the stratum basal is the layer where the cells are going to be dividing. This is where we're getting all of our new cells from. So the skin's going to take roughly a 30 day journey to get up to the surface to where we're on the outermost cells themselves. And their journey begins down here in the stratum basal. So we're going to have our keratinocytes rapidly dividing. We're going to have melanocytes giving pigment to the cells and releasing it up into the interstitial space where that can then be absorbed into our keratinocytes. So this deepest layer down here, we have our stratum basal, we've got our dividing cells, we've got our melanocytes producing pigment, that pigment's going to eventually be taken up into the cells themselves, and then we have our receptor cells, and so we have our touch ability at that point. So as things push down onto the skin, that's basically pushing all of the cells and being translated down into the sensory receptors of our Merkel cells. The next layer in we have our stratum spinosum. So stratum spinosum is the a relatively thick layer in terms of the number of cells. The cells themselves are still uh, relatively looking like they are cuboidal in nature. And so they haven't flattened out quite yet. They have kind of a 
connection between all of the cells through desmosomes and that forms this kind of like network in between them so that's where it gets its kind of prickly layer appearance to it the cells are starting to pick up all of that melanin that was coming from those melanocytes so that's moving up through the layers themselves and then we have those longer Han cells that we just saw in the, the image as well which are extending out processes that are looking for cells and structures that aren't supposed to be there next up we have our granular layer and so this is stratum granulosum this layer itself is a relatively thin layer uh, this is where the cells themselves are starting to go through some changes and so the keratinocytes are now starting to flatten out the cells are starting to essentially dry out they're starting to decrease their content within the cytoplasm for the cells themselves and they're getting ready for the final stage where they're eventually going to be all dried out and dead cells at that point and so the amount of keratin inside of them is increasing and they're getting ready for that final stage if we have thick skin we're going to have a layer here in between the last two layers and so this thick skin is going to have a stratum lucidum this stratum lucidum is just a, an extra layer or two of dead cells they don't really have any kind of um, melanin to them so they're relatively uh see-through in terms of the the cells themselves and so they're they're transparent uh within them but we only see these cells in thick skin and so we're going to see them next to or just deep to the stratum corneum of the tissue and so the stratum corneum this is what we see as our skin so when we look at our, our skin itself this is the layer of cells that we're seeing and so this is going to be also the thickest of the layer of cells in terms of the actual total thickness of cells this is our protection and so this is giving us our protection from abrasion this is our protection from something coming into us this is essentially the layer that um, things like mosquitoes and, and uh, things that sting us and things have to penetrate down through this outer tough covering in order to get into there but it does do a, a pretty good job of actually making sure that things can't get through uh, because we have a dry layer here as well um, it and we can put the sweat gland secretions out onto it it's also going to provide for a pretty good waterproofing also. but it's not a perfect job we all know that if we stay in the shower too long or in a bath or in the pool uh, we're going to come out and we're going to have absorbed some of that water the next layer down we have the dermis and so the dermis is now the middle layer of the skin itself it has a two layer component to it and so it does have a pap layer there and then it has a reticular layer to the the tissue itself and within this layer we have large number of because it is connective tissue we have a large number of fibroblasts inside here we again have our immune response so we have macrophages uh, we may have depending upon what's going on in the skin a large number of white blood cells at different times kind of perusing through the tissue determining what needs to be done the first layer the layer that's right next to the epidermis is the papillary layer this papillary layer has our areolar connective tissue uh, areolar connective tissue remember has all three kinds of fiber types um, in this case it has a large amount of collagen fibers and elastic fibers so this kind of gives the elasticity to the skin uh, allows the skin to kind of be pulled on twisted on and things like that and it doesn't really have any kind of damage to it this is also the area where we're going to have what are called dermal papillae so this is going to be the kind of ridges that form in between uh, skin itself and within this this is going to give us our things like our fingerprints um, this is going to give the ability to change the appearance of the skin as well in terms of blushing or uh, becoming very pale we have large amount of capillaries that come up into this area as well and then we have more sensory receptors in that we have Meisner's corpuscles and free nerve ending again a little bit more touch that's there next up we have the thickest layer of the skin itself we have the reticular layer and so again this has a large amount of collagen fibers to it this is going to give the strength to the skin this is going to reduce kind of pulling on the skin or tearing of the skin at times 
Uh, this is what's going to protect the skin when that does occur. And then the last layer we have our hypodermis. So the hypodermis is our um, deepest layer. This is primarily made up of adipose tissue. The amount that's there is going to vary. In some people you're going to see more adipose tissue, some people you're going to see less adipose tissue. And this is kind of that protective layer from things like bumps. Um, when we have more adipose there, we're going to have more protection from bumping into like corners of desks or tables, things like that. And when we have less of it there, we're going to be more susceptible to kind of that, that bumping into and make cause more damage to things like blood vessels and have more bruising. The outermost layer there, that epidermis, does have to grow and it's constantly being replaced and constantly being replaced. And so the deepest of the layers has stem cells within them. And this is what's producing the keratinocytes themselves and the melanocytes and that's pushing them up and pushing them up. And that whole process takes roughly a month in order to get normal cell growth. As we cause damage to the skin, as we have an abrasion, a cut, things like that, then it's going to speed up the growth process uh, in response to that damage that's there. And that's going to be the job of the release of our epidermal growth factor. If that tissue growth occurs too quickly, we can have things that cause changes to the skin itself and to its appearance and to its uh, ability to function normally. And so we have things like psoriasis. And so psoriasis takes that normal month journey to get out to the surface and cuts it down to a week. And so some seven to 10 days or so, and it's making its way all the way up. And so instead of having those outermost layers of the stratum corneum um, nice and kind of stacked on top of one another, almost like shingles on a roof where it's nice and protective, they start to come off in chunks. And so we've got layers of cells that are right next to each other. And so they'll come off in like little flakes, um, little scales almost that can peel off of the skin itself. Most common in and around the joints themselves. So things like the elbows, the fingers, uh, and the scalp. That pigmentation that's coming from the melanocytes um, allows for coloration to the skin itself. The, the melanin is our primary pigmentation that's going to be there. And it runs everything from a yellowish color um, all the way through all kinds of, of browns uh, in terms of the colors all the way up into a deep black uh, pigmentation. The amount of melanin that is being produced is variable from one person to the next. and that amount that is there is dependent upon genetics. And so genetics are going to determine how much melanin is being produced by the melanocytes that, that are there. But essentially, if we look at the amount of melanocytes that are present in any given patch of skin, if we take the same patch of skin from every person, we're going to see that we have roughly the same number of melanocytes. It's just how much production is being done by that particular uh, person. The pigmentation can be altered at times as well. And so we can have things like keratin change that uh, pigmentation. Keratin gives kind of an orangish yellow color. This is the same pigment that we find in, in orange vegetables. Um, so things like carrots and sweet potatoes um, have a keratin content to them. This gives them a bit of an orange type of an appearance to them. This is especially present after you like do uh, peel a whole bunch of carrots, you may find that your, your hands, the palms of your hands have turned kind of an orangish color. If you eat a whole bunch of orange uh, foods, your skin can start to turn orange as well. This is common in babies uh, where their skin starts to become a little bit orangish because of the food that they're eating. If they're eating a whole bunch of carrot based foods and sweet potatoes and squashes and things like that in their foods as their first foods, they may actually start to turn orange. In addition, we have hemoglobin. Uh, hemoglobin gives a pinkish hue to the skin. And so this is the same pigment that we can find in red blood cells. In that dermal layer, we also have a large number of sweat glands and these sweat glands come in several different varieties, uh, depending upon the type of sweat that we need to produce. And so we have things like eccrine sweat glands, 
these glands produce kind of a watery type of a um, secretion to them. So we find these in places, these are kind of like the, the nervous types of sweat glands. This is the palms of the, the hands, the soles of the feet, um, the forehead. That's where we're going to see this kind of watery type of a, a sweat. More of a, a lipidy type of a sweat and a protein-based type of a sweat, we have apocrine sweat glands. These are going to produce uh, after puberty primarily. And so these are going to have the areas of the, the axillary regions and the anogenital regions um, increase their productions at those times. And so this is what starts to become part of our body odor uh, production, not from the sweat itself, but from all of the bacteria that is consuming the sweat. From there, we have ceruminous glands. Ceruminous glands and mammary glands are just modifications of apocrine glands. And so they either give us our cerumen in our ear or our earwax, or it gives us mammary glands. And so we're going to have the ability to produce milk. Sebaceous glands are associated with the hair follicles themselves. And so these glands themselves produce a uh, sweat that goes up onto the hair follicles themselves. And since we have hair follicles basically everywhere on the body just about, um, we have sebaceous glands pretty much everywhere. And with these sebaceous glands, this is going to provide for protection of the skin as well as the hair itself. And so this is going to, to provide for that kind of oily secretion that gets on there. Helps with things like waterproofing um, of the skin itself. But they do have their downside in that these are the same ones that can become infected. These can be, become blocked up and we get things like acne. So I've mentioned that we have two types of skin. We have thin skin and we have thick skin. Uh, thin skin is what we have predominantly throughout the entire body. Uh, this is basically what we find all over the body itself uh, on the surface of the skin. This is going to not have any kind of stratum lucidum. So stratum lucidum we only find in thick skin, so we don't have that extra layer there. But we do have hair follicles. We do have um, sebaceous glands in thin skin, whereas in thick skin, we do not have those. So we don't have hair follicles. We don't have um, sebaceous glands in thick skin anywhere. So the palms of the feet or the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, we don't have any of the uh, hair follicles or sebaceous glands to be found there within that thick skin itself. But we do have that stratum lucidum. So we do have that extra thickening of the outer layer itself. From there we have accessory structures to the skin and so we have things like our hair and our nails and so we'll talk about the nails here and so nails themselves are just a modification of skin growth itself and so the cells themselves begin down in the nail root here and continue to work their way out to the free edge of the nail and so they're growing along the way as we look through the nail itself, we find this kind of brighter white area here. This relates to the, the lunella, so this kind of half moon shaped structure that is here. This is where we have an extra thickening of the stratum basal. And so the stratum basal is, rather than being a single layer thick there, um, it's several layers thick within that layer itself. The Skin here, as it develops into nails, becomes very, very tightly packed together. And so it's as if they are developing into layers themselves, and those layers are getting compressed down into one another. So they're extremely held tightly together. And that provides for the protective nature of nails that we have, in that we can protect the distal ends of our fingertips, as well as our toes. Um, otherwise, we would just have skin there, and if you've ever had a very uh, short cut nail, things like that, um, you know that it can be painful to, to then grab onto things. In order to seal this nail down, we have a cuticle in the top portion called the epiconium, and so that's going to seal the nail at the top there. Uh, that is oftentimes pushed back and trimmed back and, and things in nail salons, but it does provide for a protective uh, seal there so that things can't get up underneath the nail itself.
And then we also have a hyponeconium down here on the bottom to seal it down to the nail as well. Our hair is similar in the, the sense that they're densely packed together cells. Um, but the thing here is that the keratin that's produced is also a little bit different as well. And so the, the keratin is actually a, a tougher, kind of firmer type of a keratin found in the, the hair. Instead of growing out in sheets, this one develops into a filament. And so it develops into the hair characteristic hair shaft that we have within it. Um, and so it has the appearance of a shaft itself. It has what we call a cortex and a medulla. And so the outermost portion here is the cortex. The medulla then is all of the inside of the hair itself. And then the outermost layer is the cuticle. And so that is kind of the, uh, when we see it under microscope, it looks almost like individual scales sitting on the, the, the outside of the hair itself. Similar to skin, it is pigmented. And so we do have pigmentation that comes into the skin itself or into the hair follicles and that varies everything from basically being no pigmentation to being a large amount of pigmentation there um, going from blonde to black hair. What do we have hair for? Um, pretend, pretty much protection and so it's going to work almost like a hat on the top of our head so it's going to prevent heat loss in the summertime it decreases the uh, amount of potential sunburn so both on top of the head as well as on the rest of the body it's going to absorb some of that light that is there it's going to keep things out of the eyes by serving as a uh, ability to sense when something is touching the eyelashes or even the eyebrows and so all of our hair cells have what we call a hair root plexus and that hair root plexus is a bundle of nerves that actually touches each hair and you can even feel this as well. You can just take a single hair on like the back of your hand and kind of touch it with a pen or a pencil and you can feel when that hair gets bent. So very sensitive to that uh, position there. Essentially on the skin, on the surface of the body, we have hair just about everywhere. Um, thick skin, obviously, the palms and the soles of the feet. We don't have any kind of hair follicles. Other places, things like um, parts of our external genitalia, our lips, the nipples, don't have any hair follicles either. The majority of the hair um, that we have as adults is terminal hair. And so we have more of a coarse type of a hair. When we're first born, basically the only place where we have terminal hair is our eyebrows, our eyelashes, and the uh, top of our head in terms of our hair. That's there. The rest of the hair as a child then is all vellus hair. And so vellus hair is very fine. It's very uh, uh, unpigmented, very pale in terms of its appearance, um, not so coarse uh, type of hair. And then as we hit puberty, then that starts to go through some changes. But as the differences between males and females, females tend to then have that vellus hair stay on more parts of their body than that of males. So when we look at the hair follicle itself and get down deep into kind of what's going on in the cells themselves, um, we do have that hair root plexus. So we do have down around the, the root itself uh, attaching to the bulb, we have this bundle of nerves that surrounds it. And any kind of movement of the hair follicles themselves will cause that bundle of nerves to fire off. So we can feel things like um, even just a mosquito kind of flying past our skin and things like that and starting to land on there, we may feel it before it starts to bite us. And so down here you have the bulb itself. And coming into it, we're going to have all of these nerves of the hair root plexus itself down there. The growth in the root is going to, to occur. And essentially the hair grows kind of from the out, inside out. And so it's going to be coming from within the medulla and working its way out through the cortex as we're looking at the hair uh, continuing to grow until we get all the way out to the cuticle, the dead cells on the outside. And so it's similar to that of the growth of the skin in that we have all of the dead cells out on the, the far outside of the hair follicle itself. By the time we get up into the hair shaft, coming out of the 
the skin itself, all of the cells are now dead. And so that hair shaft, as it makes its way out uh, and beyond the surface of the skin, that hair shaft there is going to be completely dead cells that are at that point there. And so the, the cells have gone through all of their changes. They've made their keratin. They've added pigmentation from the melanocytes um, into them. And they're now ready to serve that protection out onto the surface of the body itself. Hair does go through some changes sometimes with age. And so in terms of males, um, baldness is primarily a function of testosterone hormones. And so one of them being dihydroxytestosterone, DHT, um, tends to be a substance that is found in greater quantity in those that have kind of male pattern baldness that's there um, for those. If with age or with even hormonal imbalance, um, both sexes can get alopecia. And so this is where the hair thins. It doesn't truly go bald, but there's uh, kind of a thinning over the entire quantity of hair itself. So primarily we look for skin for protection. Um, we're looking for that integumentary system to give us protection from all kinds of outside uh, potential damaging substances themselves um, out on the surface that we have there. <clears throat> Some other components that the, the skin can help us with because those deeper layers of the dermis are very highly vascularized, we have the potential for helping us out with both cooling and with warming. And so when we are hot, so summertime comes along, um, we get warmer, we're going to bring and open up those blood vessels out to the surface. So they're going to undergo dilation. We're going to combine that with sweating. And so we're going to increase the sweat gland secretions to help to evaporate water off and allow for cooling of the skin. But when we get cold, we're going to stop the sweating and we're going to do vasoconstriction. So we're going to tighten down all of those blood vessels at the surface of the skin and decrease the amount of warm uh, blood that's getting out to the surface itself. We just got done mentioning our uh, sensation of the hair follicles themselves. And so cutaneous sensation is also there for the skin within the, the skin layers themselves as well, in addition to those of the hair follicles. And so this gives us light touch and deep touch and pain so that we can experience the world around us and potentially um, decrease any kind of damage that may occur there within the skin itself as well. The skin can undergo some changes as far as the genetics go that are there. And so as um, primarily one of the big things that causes uh, skin cancer is sun exposure and so damage to the skin but other chemicals can can cause damage to the skin as well um, getting exposure to those different chemicals <clears throat> some of it stays in the skin some of it goes deeper into the skin um, as we get exposure to them as well and one of the big things that ends up happening is that we suppress this tumor suppressor gene called p53 and so p53 is going to generally keep skin cancers away the numbers of skin cancers uh, that become prevalent are increasing as we age. Um, and so there is a large amount of decrease in the amount of protection that we get within the skin from skin cancer the older that we do get. So skin cancer comes in three major varieties. We either have basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, or melanoma. Kind of going from um, least invasive and deadly to most invasive and deadly between those. So basal cell carcinoma, um, this is going to oftentimes look similar to that of a um, just kind of like almost like a pimple or something that just didn't heal. Um, you have all, or a scratch or something that just doesn't want to heal. Um, but it is the least malignant of all of the skin cancers themselves. It has a very high cure rate. Essentially cut it out, do an excision, and it's going to be gone. There's not going to be any kind of evidence of it being there um, from that point on. And survival rate um, and return of it is going to be basically uh, zero. 
from there we have squamous cell carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma does have a little bit more of a metastatic component to it but it does um, have good prognosis and so squamous cell carcinoma again kind of looks like a wound that may just not go away it may continually bleed and bleed and bleed and just doesn't want to go away um, within it but it does have good prognosis if we remove it and then sometimes use a little bit of extra therapy in terms of chemotherapy to uh, rid it from the body this one is kind of your weekend warrior type of a, a skin cancer oftentimes it's appearing on places like the ears uh, the lips um, the scalp those places where we might go out on the weekend not protect them and get burned over time and then the the worst of the three would be melanoma and so melanoma is definitely the one that we don't want to get um, it does grow relatively rapidly and it also has the chance of metastasis and so it will continue to go deeper and deeper into the skin leave the epidermis make its way down into the dermis um, as time goes by the one big downside with melanoma is that it oftentimes looks like a regular old mole uh, with some changes within it and so within this one here you can see that we have a portion of that mole that is a different color than the rest of the area and so that one little kind of corner there has a different color compared to the rest of it and so we don't have symmetry and so it's asymmetric in terms of its coloration that's there um, this one has kind of regular borders to it so the borders haven't changed um, the color oftentimes is uh, a different color from the rest of the moles that we may have so it may be a deeper color compared to all the rest that are on the skin and then we look for size basically can you cover it over with a pen or a pencil end and we can see here the difference between kind of moles that are benign and those that are melanoma and again oftentimes they don't really look a whole lot different to kind of the untrained eye Another type of damage that can occur to the skin is burns and so first degree burns second degree burns and third degree burns all relate to the depth of the tissue that has become involved and so first degree burns are only the epidermis second degree burns get down into the dermis itself and so this is where we start to see blisters uh, first degree burns is going to be like a sunburn uh, which is going to be redness some swelling some pain second degree burns we now start to see blisters actually starting to form because we're releasing some of that uh, extra fluid into the area and then third degree burns or, or full thickness burns this gets us all the way down through into the hypodermis and even potentially deeper layers as well and so we can see the differences within the the tissue layers themselves getting further and further down in through each layer as it goes skin can be used as a good primer for what's happening within the rest of the body as well at times and so we can see things like liver disease um, through the buildup of bilirubin in the bloodstream that then because it is a pigment um, it will start to be released into places like the skin we can see it into the sclera of the eye as well and so the skin will start to turn a yellowish color the eyes will start to turn a yellowish color if we have cardiovascular problems um, or this could even be respiratory problems as well we may see cyanosis so we may see where the tips of the fingers start to turn kind of like a purplish or a bluish even the lips um, at times if we have inflammation going on within the tissue as well we can see erythema so we're going to start to see redness under the skin because all of the blood vessels have increased in their diameter and we're trying to get that blood supply there to help to uh, heal that part of the body itself skin goes through many changes throughout the course of our lives um, all the way starting from the fetal stages themselves and so we have the epidermis <clears throat> we talked about uh, being from in terms of the the tissues we talked about epithelium coming from all layers of the the germ layers and so it does develop from ectoderm from there we have the dermis um, and hypodermis this develops from mesoderm so we have connective tissue here primarily and then when we look at the surface of the skin during the fetal stages we notice that we have kind of a waxy coat of hair on 
the surface of the skin. The hair comes from lanugo, and the waxy portion that is on the surface of the skin is the vernix caseosa. And so this is the sebaceous secretions basically protecting the skin from absorbing anything that is inside the amniotic fluid that the, the fetus is floating in. From birth until basically uh, adolescence or puberty, um, the skin is nice and soft. It's reproducing very quickly because we're growing and things like that. And then kind of puberty sets in and all bets are off. And so the skin starts to become more oily. There may be acne um, that starts to develop within the skin itself as well. Um, the skin starts to, to become oftentimes damaged. We do things when we're in our teen years that um, aren't necessarily uh, all that good for our skin. And so it may get sunburned and things like that. And all those changes start to develop and accumulate over those years. And so we may start to see some changes in and around the age of 30 or so, perhaps a little bit later, depending upon how much damage has occurred. And that's where then we start to, to go through these changes where the epidermis slows down its kind of production over time. And then as we get into old age, um, it really starts to slow down. The sweat glands start to decrease in their uh, production. We have less longer Hans cells. We have less melanocytes. So we have less protection there. And especially with the decrease of longer Hans cells, we start to see more and more skin cancer develop. And so we don't have that protection from the tissue itself there as well. If skin has damaged the tissue over time, we're going to start to see that damaged tissue continue throughout the course of uh, time as well. And it's going to damage the dermis and the hypodermis as well. And then we get things like wrinkles over time. And that can lead to quite a bit of damage on the, the surface of the skin. And so here we can see changes that occur within the skin itself um, over time. And this is a truck driver that uh, had the left side of the face out exposed to the sun itself versus the right side of the face, and we can see the changes that have occurred during that entire time. 